Welcome everyone to my YouTube channel. This is Russ Barkley and in this very short video I just want to address some of the misconceptions out there about ADHD stimulant medications. So let's get our PowerPoint up as usual and let's see if we can't get this started. There are many misconceptions out there that I encounter when I was traveling and speaking internationally with regard to the stimulant medications often used to treat children and adults with ADHD. So let's run down very quickly a list of these misconceptions that seem to be relatively commonplace out there, not only among the lay population, but I also see them in the mainstream media from time to time. The first one is that ADHD stimulant drugs are addictive as prescribed. And the answer to that is no, they're not. Not when taken orally as prescribed. However, these drugs can be abused and misused by crushing them and inhaling them like cocaine or by mixing them with a fluid and injecting them. So in that case, the drug is immediately entering the brain and it is that speed with which it enters the brain that contributes to addiction. But when taken orally, there is little or no evidence to my knowledge that there is addiction. Some people, if they use these drugs in higher doses, may develop a dependency on them, but that's a little different than an addiction. An addiction is a biological, uh, if you will, need for the medication. The body has a craving for that drug. Whereas dependence means that you've simply gotten accustomed to using that medicine at that particular time. And as a result, you've come to rely on it, perhaps to help you with your work or some such thing. But at this point, we don't have any evidence that the way we're clinically using stimulants is leading to addiction in children or adults. I've heard it said from time to time that stimulants create or increase aggressive or even assaultive behavior. Back many years ago, during the Columbine school shooting, the school shooting was blamed on ADHD stimulant medication because the shooter had, among many disorders, a diagnosis of ADHD. We've seen this in other high-profile shootings as well, uh, but we have no evidence of that. In fact, when we look at the scientific evidence, stimulants routinely reduce aggressive behavior in children and adults. So we have many population-wide studies that show a reduction, not just in aggressive behavior, but in criminal behavior or conduct problems more generally. So that's simply not the case when it comes to that claim. It's been claimed that stimulants increase the risk of seizures. Well, you would have to take a very large dose, almost the entire bottle, to put yourself at risk of a seizure. So while that potentially can happen, it's not happening at the rates with which we are or at the dose levels with which we are using these medications with children or adults. There are now several studies that show that these medicines can be used safely with people who already have a seizure disorder. And there's no increase in seizure frequency, uh, and there's no change going from no seizures to seizures in those who never had a seizure disorder. There is some evidence that those with seizures and ADHD who take stimulants might have a slightly higher rate of the usual side effects and a slightly lower likelihood of responding to the drugs. But that doesn't have anything to do with stimulants causing seizures. So we don't see that. Well, some people claim that they can cause Tourette syndrome. So if you take the medication, you're likely to develop tics, uh, nervous mannerisms, utterances, uh, the typical combination of symptoms that go with a chronic tic disorder or Tourette syndrome. And the answer to that is no. What we do find is that if you have a tic disorder, about 30% of people with that are likely to see an increase in tick frequency, mainly from the amphetamines more than from methylphenidate uh, or even than from atomoxetine or the other non-stimulants. Uh, on the other hand, those studies also show that some people with ticks show a decrease 
in the frequency of their tick disorder. The remainder show no change in tick frequency. So based on that, we don't recommend what we used to, which is that if you have a tick disorder or Tourette's, you shouldn't take these medicines. Now the approach is to go ahead and try them and to see whether or not they might increase tick frequency. If they do, stop the medication. The, they are likely to go back, that is the ticks will go back to their baseline level within a week or less. If the ticks remain at the higher frequency, it's likely not the stimulant medication. We know that in some people, ticks worsen over time. For instance, kids developing Tourette's syndrome will show a worsening of ticks and an increase in the number of ticks and frequency of ticks over time. That has nothing to do with them being on medication. So at this point, we don't caution families with Tourette's or tick disorders to avoid medication for their child's ADHD. It might well be very beneficial to helping to manage their ADHD and maybe even help with their ticks. Do these drugs cause suicide? We keep hearing this from time to time. The evidence from population-based studies is no. We do not see an increase in suicide from the drug. We see it from the disorder. ADHD increases the likelihood of attempting suicide or thinking about suicide, but especially attempting suicide, particularly during the high school years. So it's the disorder, not the drug, that is likely to be causing that increase in suicidal thinking or suicide attempt. Now, um, excuse me, let's take a look over here at some other misconceptions. These drugs don't improve academic learning. Well, it depends on what you mean by that. If you mean getting your work done in school, getting better grades because you're turning your work in, in school, behaving better in school, having more friends at school, getting disciplined less at school, all of those improve with ADHD medication. But if you mean that the achievement test, that is the measure of how much you've learned in school, is or is not improving on the stimulant medication. Well, for many years, we didn't have any evidence that academic achievement, knowledge, skill was improving on the medication, despite all these other improvements. But that's because those studies were very short term. Once we began to do studies that went out 18 months to two years in length, the evidence began to show that there was improvement in academic achievement. Reading test scores, for instance, improved. So what was happening is that it takes a while for being on stimulant medication, for those medications to transfer into learning in the school environment. They certainly don't reduce achievement. They certainly don't eliminate academic knowledge. The question was whether they improved achievement or learning in school. We used to think maybe not, but now we're not so sure about that. But certainly all these other things do improve in school, including productivity, classroom conduct, rule following, and so on. There's also been the claim that stimulants increase the risk of substance abuse. I have a separate lecture on that on this YouTube channel just to reiterate the findings from that. We now have not just 15, but actually more than 20 studies that do not show that taking stimulant medication over time from childhood to adolescence increases the risk of later substance abuse. If anything, a few studies show a decrease in the rate of substance abuse. But whether or not it decreases doesn't matter. There's no evidence that they actually can help with stimulant medication. So, so that said, we have to go along with the literature that we have available, which is no increase in risk at this point for substance abuse. Um, so let's continue on. What about causing brain damage when these drugs are used long-term? We're simply not seeing any evidence of that from oral prescribed stimulants. The evidence that is out there comes from animal studies where the drug is injected directly into the brain, or which, by the way, are often used to study drug abusing, or they come from studies of drug abusing adults where chronic stimulant misuse, as with snorting cocaine, as with taking methamphetamine, and so on. Well, of course that's going to show 
some increase in the likelihood of damage to the brain. But that's because they're being taken either intranasally or intravenously. Oral administration does not seem to be linked to any kind of brain damage. If anything, we now have more than 34 studies showing that about 25 to 40 percent of people who stay on medication for at least two years or longer actually show improved growth in the brain in those regions related to their ADHD. So that's a very positive finding. It's often referred to as neuroprotection or neuroenhancement, but there's a lot of evidence out there for that. But regardless of whether there is neuroprotection or not, we don't have any evidence that oral use as prescribed with stimulants is leading to brain damage. Now, are these drugs being overprescribed? Well, it's hard to tell. In some small regions, they might be within a particular county or part of a state. In others, they're being prescribed very little at all. So if that's the case, then what we might see is that uh, we would see a huge variation in drug use in the population. Uh, and that's what we do see. But overall, nationally, in the U.S., we're seeing about 4% of kids are taking a stimulant medication, and about 6.6% .6 of adults are on medication. Now, is that higher than the population prevalence? After all, overprescribing means we're giving more drug than there is more disorder in the population. Well, there's about 7 to 8% prevalence rate of ADHD in children in the U.S., and the rate in adults is about 5 to 6 percent. So when it comes to kids, we're not seeing overprescribing. The most recent studies show that the level of stimulant medication used over the past decade has remained relatively stable, maybe even declining somewhat in children, whereas it is increasing among adults and especially among females. Uh, and that's because these were the underdiagnosed segments of the ADHD population in prior decades. So it's not surprising that we would see such an increase. Let's also keep in mind that while the 6.6% .6 prevalence for adults for medication use appears to be very close to the population prevalence, the fact is stimulant medications are given for other reasons than ADHD, such as narcolepsy, such as arousal problems uh, in the elderly, and so on. And so we have to back down that rate of prescribing by removing those people who don't have ADHD but might be given the drugs for other reasons. When we do that, it's pretty clear that the prescribing rates for adults with ADHD don't exceed the population prevalence. Now, some people claim that kids are being overdosed, they're being given way too much drug for their age, size, need, severity of disorder, and so on. If anything, the evidence shows that that is not the case that, it, that pediatricians in general who are doing most of the prescribing are in fact uh, using lower doses than would be used by child psychiatrists or others who are more expert in their use. Uh, we often see kids being said to not have a good drug response when in fact it's that their physician is not using an adequate dose of the medication. Uh, some people claim these drug drugs are just a band-aid. They're just covering up the real problem, uh, whether that's attributing it to bad parenting or like uh, Gabor Mate attributing it to tr generational or childhood trauma, uh, and therefore there's no need for these medications. We just have to address the real source of the problem. I have other videos on that that clearly show that that is not the case. Those are not the causes of ADHD, and therefore these drugs aren't covering anything up at all. Some people say they're just a chemical straitjacket that are turning kids into zombies just to quell their misbehavior and make them more manageable to parents and teachers. Kind of a mother's or teacher's little helper accusation here. But that suggests that these drugs don't do anything positive. They're just being used to sedate and manage disruptive individuals. And that's just not true. We have 
hundreds of studies that attest to the myriad positive benefits that these medicines convey to individuals with ADHD who take them. I don't need to list all of them, there are many of them, but it includes even reducing the risk of death by accidental injury, reducing all of the other risks with, associated with school dropout, with lower grades, the risk with driving and car accidents, the risk of pregnancy, uh, and so on. There are just many, many risks that these drugs drugs reduce. Um, so the benefits of the drugs clearly uh, outweigh their side effects and no evidence that we're simply sedating people into submission. So I hope that you've learned a lot from this very short video. Sorry my phone was going off uh, during the presentation, uh, but the overall pattern here is that there's a lot of misconceptions in the population about these medications and the vast majority of them are simply not true or we need a more nuanced view of the accusation. But at this point, I think that we can safely dispense with these mythologies and folklore. So thanks for joining me, everybody. I appreciate it. And I'll see you in a few days with another video upload. Take care and be well.